Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, we have Oliver Dunford, uh, staff attorney at Pacific Legal Foundation. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And Andrew Patz, the uh, secretary, the newly elected secretary of the Sacramento County Libertarian Party. Welcome to the show, Andrew. Thank you. Uh, speaking of the uh, newly elected, you got uh, elected as uh, secretary. That's the first time for you, and yes. uh, other officers were elected. What else is going on at the Sacramento LP? Uh, well, what we've got going on is uh, we are sending a lot of letters to our Libertarian registered voters, trying to get people to donate time and money to okay. help the Libertarian Party. Okay, uh, and uh, I, I, I take it uh, that's uh, a place where volunteer effort could be uh, could be used to get all those uh, cards and letters in the mail. Oh, uh, definitely. We need a lot more volunteers. Okay, to help get the word out. Yeah, you're the primary volunteer right now, right? Yes. And how many cards and letters have you uh, hand addressed <laughs> so far? Uh, probably about. Four or five hundred. Four or five hundred. Yes. And do you have a full-time job as well? Yes. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. really, it's only two or three hours a day that I just sit down and hand write some addresses. Okay, and, th and this is to all of the registered libertarians in Sacramento County. Yes. Okay. How many uh, registered libertarians are there in Sacramento County? Uh, we've got about one percent of the registered uh, voters. I'm not sure how many that is. Okay, and. Uh, how many how many of those registered Libertarian Party uh, uh, registries are re people who how many of the people who are registered Libertarian how, are, how many people are actually members dues paying members of the uh, of the L of the local LP? Uh, I'm not too sure about that. Okay, but you're trying to get trying to make it more. Right. Okay. What else is the LP going to be doing over the next several uh, months and years here locally? We are working on local elections. We've got uh, Janine. DeRose, trying to work on getting Sacramento District 6. Senate District? Yes. Okay, who's she running against? Is that Pam? Pam, yeah. yes. Okay. And she's getting a, 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 you know, an early start because the, the election is not until 2018, is that correct? Right, but it's never too early. Is that going to be a, a three-way race, two-way race? How's that going to play out? Um, I think it's a three-way race. Okay. We'll see how it goes. Okay. Um, the, uh, Oliver, the... Uh, Center for Biological Diversity, an old friend of, uh, <laughs> of yours, I'm sure, has filed a suit to avoid the use of the Congressional <laughs> Review Act, uh, which is a, 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 an act that provides a means for Congress to overturn, ru overturn rules imposed by regulatory agencies on constitutional grounds. The, the, the C, C, CB, CBD suit is saying that, that the Congressional Review Act, as it's being used, is unconstitutional. How do you feel about that? Uh, we disagree. And uh, we moved to intervene in the lawsuit. Uh, it's up in Alaska. Uh, CBD is arguing that the Congressional Review Act, uh, by allowing Congress to invalidate regulations, is uh, getting power from the executive that uh, that they should not be allowed to to have. Uh, in other words, they're arguing that once the regulation is in place, unless Congress goes back and amends the statute that originally granted. Uh, the regulatory authority uh, that the regulation stays in place forever. And so okay, let me let me, let me just kind of do the do the fundamentals of yeah. what the how Congress uh, grants rulemaking authority to regulatory agencies and what the Congressional Review Act does to uh, kind of rein that in. Could you, you know, sure. lower that into in uh, uh, layman's <laughs> language? Yeah, uh, the Congress can write a law saying the Secretary of in this case, the interior uh, shall do X. Uh, so to carry out its purposes, for example, to take care of federal lands in Alaska, uh, the secretary is permitted to write certain rules for that area of land. Uh, then usually the regulations have to go through a procedure so they get adopted by the agency itself. With so hear it, public hearings? With public like. hearings and evidence and sometimes testimony and things like that. Uh, so it's not a law, but uh, the agencies. But, have, but it's a regulation that has the force of law. It has reg essentially the force of law, and, and under the way it's been interpreted, Congress is allowed to delegate some of its rulemaking authority to these agencies. Uh, in 1996, uh, President Bill Clinton signed the Congressional Review Act, and it had uh, wide bipartisan support, including Harry Reid, who in his, in his uh, retirement announcement uh, said that was one of his uh, it, one of the things he was most proud of in his career. 
And of course, now it's being panned. Well, good for good for hearing. I, I know we agree with them once in a while. Um, and under the Congressional Review Act, it gives Congress uh, authority under expedited means. And for one thing, the Senate cannot use a filibuster uh, when a Congressional Review Act bill is being considered. Uh, so each House of Congress has to pass a resolution. The president has to sign it, and if it if it's signed, then that particular bill will invalidate a rule. And in the CBD case, uh, there was a refuges rule which prohibited hunting and trapping uh, and other access to federal land in Alaska. Uh, all, all over Alaska? Or in, in, in a certain, in a certain uh, wildlife uh, national refuge in Alaska. Okay. Um, and the, uh, one of the bills passed through the Congressional Review Act and validated that regulation which means the uh, land in Alaska will be now open or more open to, to access. CBD is challenging that invalidation of the rule. So they're challenging, okay, so Congress passed a law saying that the Department of Interior can write rules, uh, in this case regulating hunting and fishing and access to uh, wilderness areas. And uh, that, so that they went through the formal rulemaking procedure and so forth. They, 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 they sent it up to Congress for the Congressional Review Act so Congress can review it. Right. Congress has reviewed it and said, no, we don't like that rule. You will, uh, that rule is now null and void. Is That's that, right. Okay. That's right. And can't be uh, rewritten in like form. Is that correct? That's right. Well, the Congressional Review Act also provides that a regulation uh, substantially similar to the regulation that's been invalidated cannot be adopted. It cannot be adopted by the rulemaking authority that's right. of, the, of the agency. That's right. It can be adopted by Congress. Sure. But not by the, but not by the, Regulatory agency. That's right. Okay, and so the CBD is saying that Congress cannot rescind uh, power they've delegated. Is that kind of what they're saying? Basically, that they cannot rescind a uh, a rule uh, unless they first go back and amend the initial statute that gave the Department of the Interior the authority to adopt rules in the first place. Oh, so they're saying that they have that, that Congress has to essentially say, no, you, you, we're not giving you the authority to That's do right. that. That's right. They're saying that Congress, basically what they're saying is Congress cannot pass a law that invalidates a rule. Okay. And, and you're arguing that of course they That can. of course Congress can pass a law uh, to invalidate a rule. Okay. Uh, do you anticipate that you will win on this case? I, I think so. Uh, we've just moved to intervene at this point. Uh, the government is also a party. We expect the government to defend uh, the law. Uh, but we're in there to um, press our interests and, and to press our expertise in the Congressional Review Act. Um, one of our colleagues, Todd Gaziano, is a, drafted the bill when he was a congressional aide, uh, and he is now running our red tape rollback pro project. Uh, we're trying to identify more rules uh, for Congress to uh, eliminate, and so uh, we think we bring in a special expertise to the case. I understand that uh, the, uh, the Trump administration crowing about how many how much legislation they passed in their first 100 days or whatever, yeah. was saying that they had passed more legislation than any other administration <laughs> uh, in history or something along those lines yeah. since uh, the Truman administration, I don't know, for a long time. But almost everything that they've passed has been Congressional Review Act right. rollbacks. Is right, they've, they've passed, uh, it's, it's either 13 or 14 now, I can't remember exactly, um, okay. regulations that have been uh, invalidated through so, the Congressional So 13 Review. bad regulations down? That's right. How many did it go? Uh, well, <laughs> Uh, there's still hundreds or thousands uh, sitting out there. Uh, the Congressional Review Act requires an agency to submit a proposed rule to Congress, and after that submission, Congress has 60 days to consider it. And now, my understanding is that there's an awful lot of uh, rules that never got submitted to Congress. Is that's that correct? Right. That's right. And so, so now they have to submit? They have to submit. Uh, before they take effect is the, is the language of the, of the act. So in other words, a rule that's on the books being enforced is not really it can't really be enforced until until the review act goes through. That's right. Until the time uh, set forth in the in the review act is uh, lapses. Interesting. Okay. okay. What what's next on the target for congressional review? Um, I don't know. Uh, we are still we we have a lot of partners. I guess that's up to the Trump administration, right? Right. We, we've we've submitted uh, a number of rules for consideration, and uh, we'll continue to talk to people on the Hill and in the White House, and um, hoping to get a lot more withdrawn. Okay, uh, another interesting case that I, I know that you have uh, have some uh, influence on is the uh, the public trust doctrine. Uh, this is a case in Lake Michigan, Lake Michigan beachfront owned by Don and Bobby Gunderson. 
and uh, they would like to keep uh, trespassers from playing on their beach, playing volleyball on their, in, That's their, right. in their backyard or their front yard, as the case may be. Mm -hmm. But the state of, uh, was it Ohio? Indiana. The state of Ohio was saying that uh, we, we're going to give the beach up to the high water mark to the public to right. play on. Right. What is the high water mark in a non-tidal body of water? Well, that's the dispute. And, and under English law, uh, coastal areas, which would mean on the on the ocean, uh, that the public, uh, the government, is deemed to have an interest in the water itself and in the in the land under the water. Um, and as that applied into the United States, particularly here on the Great Lakes, uh, the dispute is where that line ends. Uh, and so should it end at the water's edge? Should it end at the high water mark, as you mentioned, or should it be some other arbitrarily uh, picked line? Well, in California, there is a high water mark because you've got high tide and low You've got tide. the tides, right. But there's no tides on Lake Michigan no. the last time I looked. That's right. And so uh, the state of Indiana adopted a regulation uh, determining uh, a line which, which has been declared the uh, public trust doctrine line. How did they come up with that line? I, I don't know, but it was, uh, no one seems to like it. Um, where it was, but but it is at, le at least it's some point on, up on the dry beach land property of the Gundersons. Uh, and so under the traditional public trust doctrine, uh, navigable waters can be used by the public. Uh, and, and originally it was for basically commerce and fishing. Mm -hmm. uh, and over the last uh, several decades, courts have expanded that. And now it includes everything from sunbathing to recreation to picnics. Uh, and so the Gundersons are trying to keep people um, from recreating on their private property. So in other words, the Gundersons would be happy to have somebody floating on a, on a, uh, a raft or a, a, a air mattress uh, uh, in two feet of water off their, off their beach, but not on their beach. Well, you can, I mean, I think, the, again, the idea is, is, is moving around, not, not setting up shop uh, mm -hmm. on the beach or, or right, right at the beach. Uh, the state of Michigan, for example, uh, allows allows people to walk through. Mm. Um, Indiana has a, has a broader definition and, and thinks that anything, uh, anything that you can use the water for basically becomes a, a public uh, purpose. Even though, there's, even though it's not actually water? That's right. Okay. I think I understand, but it's, I'm not sure. Yeah. Is this really just a way for the state of Indiana to grab land for public recreating uh, without paying for it? Well, that's right. We, we, that's what we argued in our brief, uh, that the, if the state of Indiana uh, is sincere that this is that a public use on someone's property includes sunbathing and playing volleyball, then they should pay for it. Just like if any one of us wanted to use somebody's land uh, to play volleyball on, we'd have to pay rent or, or lease it for the week or, or whatever. But Indiana just wants to declare it a matter of public property. And just basically just take it. And just take it, yeah. Okay. Well, you know, sunbathers everywhere should, should rejoice. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> In, in San Francisco, uh, the uh, case that you're looking at is the Book Passage uh, case, uh, First Amendment case. Tell mm -hmm. us about that. Uh, this comes under a state law that was originally written uh, to apply to sports memorabilia, okay. uh, and specifically autographed memorabilia, uh, as a way to protect consumers from purchasing fraudulently signed items. Uh, Apparently, at the um, urging of uh, Mark Hamill, uh, Luke Skywalker, uh, the state has broadened the definition of what a collectible is. But they made it so broad that basically anything with a signature on it that's worth more than $5 falls under the act. Uh, and so if you sell something like that, you have to provide a certificate of authenticity, and you have to attest that it's true. If there's a witness, you have to give the witness's name and, and address, I think, and then if you if you buy it from a third party, you have to have that person's information, and uh, and then you have to keep the certificate, a copy of it for seven years, and and there's these uh, many more regulations, uh, and so the book passage, uh, which is owned by uh, Bill Petrocelli and his wife, uh, hosts I think it's over 700 author events every year. So a couple a day. Right. Uh, they have three locations in the Bay Area. Okay. Uh, authors come in, give a talk, and sign their books. Uh, and so those books would now be subject to the 
uh, this law that requires these onerous uh, requirements. So it's just a, just a nightmare of red tape in order to. Uh, nightmare well, of red. What are the penalties if you if you don't do it? Well, the, the that that even with with no wrongdoing. So even if if uh, if Bill uh, filled out a certificate of authenticity incorrectly, just made a, a mistake, even uh, with no intent to defraud, uh, there'd be a civil penalty which could be up to ten times the damages. Uh, plus attorney's okay, fees. What, what would be the damages of getting a, a book with a fake signature? Well, that's the other part of that the law doesn't make too much sense as it applies at least to uh, book passage, is that uh, the customers don't pay any premium for the autograph. They buy the book for the, for the price. They don't pay an extra $5 or anything for the signature itself. So it is hard to imagine what the damages would be. I suppose if you want a book without a fraudulent autograph, you could claim damages are the price of the book. I don't know. Uh, but the damages would be 10 times that, uh, plus attorney's fees, uh, expert witness fees, and the judge could also determine, depending on the egregiousness of the conduct, to impose an additional penalty. Okay, don't auction houses like Christie's and Sotheby's have uh, a, uh, a way of uh, vetting the pedigree of art that works perfectly well, but it's totally in the private sector? Uh, you would think uh, that Californians could, could figure this out. Um, and no, I mean, this, this, isn't no, this something that can be handled? I think so. Uh, and, and, very easily uh, without, without the, yes. the, the heavy hand of, uh, of uh, Sacramento? Uh, of course. Uh, there's always uh, you, the common law uh, action for fraud still exists. Uh, you could sue. Um, the, especially when you're buying a book in person from the author who signs the book in front of you, uh, the chances for fraud are uh, vanishingly thin. Um, so we sued, uh, uh, arguing that it's a First Amendment violation to um, regulate the sales of books like this. So, who, so you're suing? We're suing uh, the state of California okay. uh, on behalf of Book Passage uh, and Mr. Petrocelli, uh, and we'd like to see this law uh, invalidated. On, on First Amendment grounds? On First Amendment grounds. And equal protection, because it, it exempts uh, pawn shops and certain online retailers uh, oh, which online retailers? Well, it's certain, it's, it's no, nobody specific, but it just the uh, certain online marketers, I think is what the, is what the term is. Uh, so eBay doesn't have to worry eBay, about eBay, I think, would, would fit within that exemption. And so, and so the entities most likely, uh, not necessarily to defraud you on purpose, but where fraud is more likely to happen in a pawn shop and online, they're exempt from the law, whereas booksellers, when you buy it in person from the author. Uh, okay, so what? is the reason that Luke Skywalker would want to exempt uh, I, pawn shops? I, I can guess. I, I'm, I'm guessing that his autograph, fraudulent autographs of his have, uh, have appeared and, and I guess he's losing money. And he, he's upset about that? Yeah. And he has friends in high places? I guess so. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, this is a political issue uh, that has to do with the law. There's a, there was a district uh, attorney race in Philadelphia recently and a public defender by the name of Larry Krasner uh, won the Democratic primary in Philadelphia uh, for, this, for district attorney on a platform of, this is interesting, ending mass incarceration, ending cash bail, uh, reducing civil asset forfeiture. I don't know why he's not ending civil asset forfeiture, <laughs> but he's at least going in the right direction. And uh, preventing uh, seized loot, uh, presumably from civil asset forfeiture, from uh, being used to uh, directly fund the district attorney's office. Uh, and of course, winning a primary in Philadelphia on the Democratic side is kind of is tantamount to winning the general election because I think the voter registration uh, ratio is something like seven to one Democrat or something like that. It's it's you know if you win the Democratic primary, you've won essentially. So the uh, the DA's office. Or the uh, you know the existing DA the you know the, the the established law enforcement entities are not real happy about this I would I wouldn't imagine right Andrew right <laughs> <laughs> well it's interesting that someone is finally stepping up to the government and saying that we're tired of the mass incarceration and the uh, civil asset forfeiture so I'm pretty glad that. Someone's finally starting to do something about this. It's interesting that it's uh, you know it's the it's the public voting mm -hmm. uh, against all of these things. I mean, there there was a time and a place where uh, being uh, anything other than a law and order candidate would not bode well for your electoral uh, ability, particularly running for DA. Right. But it looks like that uh, that tide has changed at least in Philadelphia. Yes. Uh, I'm also curious to know what his stance on marijuana is, see if he's 
for or against that? Yeah, I don't know what's the I don't know what the status of marijuana is in, in in Philadelphia or in Pennsylvania. I'm not sure what what state law is there. Not sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, interesting. I mean, is this a a, a, a harbinger of the the times they are changing uh, as far as uh, uh, hard nosed prosecution? I think so. Okay. Uh, the liberal blog, uh, the liberal plunder blog, and the conservative uh, Portage County Tea Party. Uh, in Ohio have teamed up to challenge a new Ohio law that says, and I quote, no person shall knowingly post a text or audio statement or an image on an internet website or web page for the purpose of abusing, threatening, or harassing another person, end quote. Uh, the, uh, the suit that has been filed by dogs and cats cooperating is uh, that this is overly broad and it's a prohibition, essentially, a prohibition of criticizing public officials. Yeah, I think there's a First Amendment problem here. Um, certainly, uh, if it, it precluded fighting words or something like that, but, uh, you know, abusing or threatening uh, another person, um, every political ad we see is, is uh, abusing and, and potentially threatening. So. Uh, uh, this does have a, ch a, a, a danger of chilling uh, perfectly acceptable and perfectly uh, constitutional speech. Uh, even even uh, when you're not talking about public officials, it would seem to me that this is overly broad. Even you know just you know, criticizing your neighbor because he doesn't pick up the trash. That's would. right. That's right. There was a there was a suit a few years ago. Uh, a, c a congressman uh, Driehaus, I think his name was, uh, and a uh, he voted for the Obamacare bill. Uh, he was a pro-life Catholic, and he got um, criticized by a group of pro-life uh, people in Ohio, and they put a billboard up, and I forget exactly what it said, but it clearly raised abortion in the, in the, in the Obamacare bill, uh, and he sued under a, um, a, a statute in Ohio, uh, and it was, uh, I forget the language exactly, but it had something to do with false statements made about a public figure, essentially, uh, and he lost, uh, because in the Supreme Court held that those kinds of Arguments should be made out in public. So, is this is this particular statute perhaps something that was written to remedy that court decision? I, I don't know if it was, but it, it certainly looks that way. But I, I don't know the history of it. It's it's interesting the way the the, the things are starting to play out. I mean, we're looking at uh, Ohio uh, uh, trying to uh, you know come you know go after free speech. We're looking at uh, in your case, uh, uh, the uh, uh, the bookseller uh, in San Francisco, uh, you know, they're they're fighting a free speech case. Uh, is, is this part and parcel of the of the whole uh, uh, attitude that we're seeing, uh, in particularly on college campuses, where you are essentially prohibited from <coughs> stating something that's not politically correct? You're disinvited to events if you're not if you don't follow the. the uh, Politically correct uh, party line. Yeah, that's is right. It all, is all part and parcel, all the same uh, mindset. Well, I, you know, in, in both the Ohio case and then in, in, in our, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, in the in the, the Ohio statute, and then in, in our First Amendment case for book passage, uh, we're getting a lot of support um, from people who may not traditionally support PLF. Um, you know, we're seen as uh, uh, defending people on the right, uh, but the First Amendment usually cuts across. Uh, those kinds of ideological lines, and uh, you see in the Ohio uh, lo lawsuit, the conservative group and the and the progressive group getting together to to strike that down. Um, I, I'm sure some of that's a, a, a response to what they see on college campuses and 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 uh, people being shouted down instead of just listened to. Um, so, and I hope that's the case. I hope that. Uh, yeah, I mean, the the traditional attitude is the antidote to unfriendly or bad or, or uh, derogatory speech is more speech. More speech. Yeah, more speech, you know, uh, you know speak back. Uh, right. And it would seem to me that uh, this would not only uh, stifle criticism of public officials, but it would, it would seem to me, allow public officials to say whatever they darn well please without fear of criticism. Well, that's right. I've, I've seen um, all, many of the campaign finance bills be described as uh, incumbent protection acts. Uh, because you're allowing people in power to decide who gets to talk. Uh, and one of the first things they're going to prevent is any criticism of themselves. Andrew, do you have any, any thoughts on, on any of this? 
Well, I was wondering, is the law supposed to be about public officials, or it kind of looks like it was made to stop bullying, like cyberbullying? Yeah, well, I mean, that you could interpret it that way. Yeah. But you could interpret it uh, on both ways. Definitely. It seems, uh, and, and again, it is a pretty vague... Cy cyberbullying, what, what is that? Uh, that's I mean, when is, that, is that when you say, uh, hey, you know, neighbor, I don't like the fact that you don't, uh, you know, mow your lawn. Uh, uh, is, is that cyberbullying? Well, it's kind of... Uh, if, you, if you say, it on, you know, on a public forum and, you know, or, you know, whatever. Well, it's just harassment, really. Okay. Should that be illegal? No. I mean, should criticism of other people's bad actions or any action be any action you disagree with, should it be illegal to be critical of, of, uh, of other, other people or other uh, ways of life or other cultures, whatever? No, definitely not. Because then you're just opening the door for anything else to be illegal, really. Like any other kind of speech. Now, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of not being critical <laughs> in my personal life. Right. But I don't, I don't see why. I, I, I don't let that you know, carry over into my, uh, my political attitudes because God knows the politicians we've uh, elected, most of them deserve a whole hell of a lot of criticism. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, anyway, we're, we'll, 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 uh, we'll watch these cases very carefully. Is the Libertarian Party going to get involved in any, uh, uh, you know, will that, will that be part of the, uh, the LP platform in Sacramento uh, going forward? Free speech? Yeah. Yes. Well, free speech. We love, and, and, we love free speech. And uh, applied free speech is kind of what we're looking at here. Yeah, I love free speech. <laughs> Don't speak too much, but you love it. <laughs> yeah, it's great. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Okay. Um, well, uh, <laughs> Thank you very much for being part of the show, Andrew. Thank you. Andrew Pants, the uh, secretary of the Sacramento County LP. Uh, Oliver uh, Dunford, attorney at staff attorney at Pacific Legal Foundation. Uh, welcome to the show, and also I'd like to point out that you can uh, tune in to Pacific Li or to uh, uh, to the Libertarian Counterpoint on uh, Channel 17 in Sacramento. Uh, it's on the air on the first uh, Thursday or on every Thursday at 8 p.m. every uh, Friday at 12 noon. And if you're up late enough every uh, uh, Saturday morning at 4 a.m., that's all Pacific time. If you're in uh, other parts of the world, you can watch us on the web at www.accesssacramento.org, uh, or you can uh, always catch the show where we archive it on YouTube. Thank you very much for being part of the show. We'll see you again next week. Thank you. Thank you.